New from the Embedded podcast. Female athletes have always needed grit and talent. But for decades, they've also needed a certificate. There was chit-chat about, is that really a woman? And even now, they're still being checked and questioned. Their story is the newest series from CBC and NPR's Embedded. It's called Tested. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You rely on this podcast to stay informed and connected with your local community. And we rely on you. Without listener support, this show simply wouldn't exist. Be a part of the team that makes this show possible by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute. Donate at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thank you. There are a lot of stories about the financial challenges facing schools right now. Seattle School District has a $100 million budget gap they need to close, and they're going to be shuttering schools to make ends meet. Bellevue School District also closed schools to shore up its budget last year. Other districts are looking at million-dollar shortfalls and considering school closures or ending programs. But Marysville School District is facing a particularly challenging landscape. They have a critically declining financial condition. That's Washington State Auditor Pat McCarthy. Her office reviews the finances of all 295 school districts in the state. And their report on Marysville's finances made headlines when it was published last week. The severity of their situation is to some degree probably reminiscent of what happened to a small district called Vader about 17 years ago. Vader School District in southwest Washington dissolved in 2007 after a series of failed levies and bonds. In a press release, the Office of the State Auditor said one measure they look at for a school district's health is how many days of operating expenses are available in a general fund. Ideally, that would be 60 days. Last year, Marysville School District held just over 18 days of operating expenses. This year, that number is negative 11 days. So it raises the level of how dire the situation is for Marysville. For about a year, the district has been in what's called binding conditions with the Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction. That allows the district to borrow against their future state funds. But it also requires a financial plan to reach stability. They need to be embracing their situation and recognizing it and saying, okay, all of these things may have happened, but we've got a school district with 9,700 kids and we better figure this out. And they are tough decisions. In a statement responding to the audit report, Marysville officials said the district has made significant budget cuts and is continuing to work towards getting out of binding conditions with the state. As I mentioned, Marysville is far from the only district struggling with finances in western Washington. So what's going on at Marysville, and how does it fit in the larger landscape of budget challenges at districts statewide? Marguerite Rosa is the director of the Edunomics Lab and a research professor at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. And she joins me now. Hi, Marguerite. Great to have you back on Soundside. Happy to be here. So a recent audit of Marysville School District points to a district in deep financial trouble, running in the red. This is unprecedented territory for a district of its size. What are the stakes here? What happens if a district cannot shore up its budget? Well, so first of all, just to back up a little bit, the all these school districts, they get money from the state and the federal government and sometimes from local levies. And they use the money to pay for their teachers and to pay electrical bills and all those kinds of things to run schools. And it's a primary job of leaders, especially even school board members, is to be that fiduciary, to take in this money and deploy the the funds in reasonable, thoughtful ways. Second responsibility, hire the superintendent. But those are the primary responsibilities. And a lot of school board members get elected without a lot of experience in managing multi-million dollar budgets. And the district team may be helping them do that, right? Preparing financial statements. But that work is is really important. It takes a lot of scrutiny. And usually it goes relatively smoothly. And sometimes it goes really badly. So this will be an example of when it goes badly. And we do see this happen across the country. Sometimes a district will pop up as having some sort of financial mess, and it can happen for various reasons. And ultimately, in the end, it can really affect students. So what happens if you don't have enough money? 
is that you can apply to the state for a waiver and end school early. So kids are getting less days of school. You know, you can walk back the salaries of your staff. You can start doing layoffs. You can tell your administrators, we're only going to pay you for so many days. Things like that. We're going to eliminate transportation, start eliminating electives and all these things. And the unwinding of these financial commitments, it's fairly chaotic for the district. And so that's why, you know, you end up with really upset staff, upset parents, and kids who aren't getting that sort of smooth and reliable education delivery that they're expecting. Can that also lead to kind of a spiral for a district? Because if you're a parent who has the means to pull your kid out of that district as it's going through all of these really tough cuts, potentially ending school early, things like that, it seems like it could lead to a flight situation from the district where enrollment simply dwindles even more. And that's more of a budget challenge for the board. Yes, although I I don't think that's the biggest factor. So generally speaking, and this is true across Washington State districts, that enrollments have been declining. But those tend to be, you know, a half a percent a year or something like that. And even in a fiscal crisis situation like this, families would have to go find an alternate placement for their child. So they'd have to go around and find either private schools that were open and then find the money to pay their kids, you know, for all the spots. And the system doesn't usually have that much capacity to absorb that. Or they'd have to say, I'm out, I'm going to homeschool my kid. And homeschooling is not a super easy alternative for many families to pick up. So even in districts where you're seeing the chaos affect families, where you already are, you're not seeing massive changes in their enrollment as a factor. So uh, how that plays out for Marysville, I can't say. But really what you end up seeing is a whole lot of kids that are still at the district that are not being served well. Mm. Marysville is the largest district in Washington state to go into what's called binding conditions with the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction. What does that mean? What does that oversight look like? Right. Well, um, Seattle would be in binding conditions, but they got to deal with the legislature so they can borrow this loan from their capital funds. And they got out of binding conditions for that. And it was like a one off deal. So I I don't want to say that that Marysville, the only one, I think the OSPI probably didn't want to come in and take over the finances of Seattle. But what binding conditions mean is that so this happened years ago that some of these districts got themselves in financial trouble. And the legislature instructed OSPI, you need to step in if a district is headed for financial trouble. And you can see that in their financial reports that get submitted to the state. So OSPI essentially comes in and says, all right, it looks like you are in financial trouble. We will come up with a list of things you must do in order to either front you some money so you can finish the school year or other other kinds of things like that. So the binding conditions are things like you must reduce your staffing by X or you must get this done by this date or things like that. So what the district is, is doing when it gets itself into financial trouble is surrendering some of its financial decision making to OSPI. And in other states, some of that state control can be even more aggressive. Like the state can invalidate the labor contract and say, sorry, you can't promise all these these things to the labor agreement. Oh, wow. So the binding conditions are really just a kind of a top-down way to force the district into a serious commitment to address its financial troubles so it can get back on track. I want to zoom out and talk more generally about the financial issues that districts are facing all over the country, really, and and all over Washington state. And part of that is the end of COVID federal aid. So there's also declining enrollment, of course, a huge issue in Washington state. With the COVID aid, how did districts spend that COVID money? And what is the impact now of it going away? Yeah, so the, this money is called the ESSER or the Federal Relief Funds. It really was kind of a blank check. Districts could do what they wanted. And in Washington state, many of them used the Federal Relief Funds to backfill parts of their budget as enrollments dropped or some of the expenses that the state wasn't going to cover because they weren't going to get reimbursed on transportation and things like that. And then also hire a lot of new staff, maybe give out more healthy pay raises, which coincided with inflation. So there was some some good justification for that. The issue with all of those is that the federal 
relief aid was temporary. It's, you know, sort of one-time money. And most districts budget their their budget every year, assuming that everything in their revenues are going to roll over again to the next year. And these monies aren't rolling over this next year. So now if a district saw enrollment declines, it's going to finally have to do that work of downsizing its operation, maybe closing some schools if it has too many schools or eliminating some classrooms if it had too many classrooms, that kind of thing. And so that is happening at the same time, the district has also maybe committed to these labor contracts that have promised year over year raises and raise the overall salary levels. And um, there isn't, you know, a, a revenue source for that. So if this money was used for some of that, then, you know, the district's in financial trouble. And that's why I think we're seeing across Washington state, you know, it all sort of happened at once. It's those, those three variables, the as for money disappearing at the same time, these enrollments have been falling a little bit because enrollment drives revenue. And then all of these bigger labor contracts that were part of the inflation. Some districts brought on new staff, including in Washington state with their ESSER money. And now it's always hard for districts to downsize their staffing. They don't you know, love to hand out pink slips and that kind of thing. And as, as anybody who's been reading the, the news, the, the job market is softening. We're seeing unemployment tickle up. So some of the school districts thought, well, every year, a lot of people will leave on their own, but this year they're not leaving because they can't get a job anywhere else because no one else is hiring, that kind of thing. So it's a whole lot of financial stressors at once. Was there serious mismanagement to not see that that COVID aid was going to be a limited thing and make commitments that went beyond when the aid was likely to dry up? I mean, was that something that districts just had to do the kind of spending with that aid that, you know, they kind of like on a hope and a prayer that they would find a way to bridge in the future? Well, so t- first of all, two things. Not all districts spent the money on things that were recurring costs. So some didn't. And so some said, fine, I'll pay some of my staff a stipend to do summer school. That's an easy thing to walk back, right? Because you just sort of undo that. Or I'm going to do some facilities upgrades. And now I have the facilities upgrades. I don't need to recur. That's not a recurring cost. I don't want to say that all districts spend the money in a way that sort of up their bottom line. Um, but some some definitely did. The other thing I'll say is that when all those kids were coming back to school after COVID, wouldn't have been the right time to downsize, right? That Can you imagine if we were handing out pink slips as we were trying to get people comfortable to come back to school and I'm sorry, your teacher's gone or this, that, or the other. So some delaying of that downsizing, I think was, was rational. It should not have caught people by surprise this year. They really should have been laying the groundwork the last 18 months or so to for a smooth transition. And in fact, you did see some districts do that. Bellevue closed schools you know, earlier on um, because they could see their enrollment had dropped and they needed to do that to kind of square their budget a little earlier. So I think waiting till the ma- last moment was was not the right choice in some districts. The other thing I'll say is that the federal government gave out 10% of all ESSER funds to the state OSPI to help supervise, manage, support, and build skills around this. Like I said, most district leaders haven't been in a situation like this before. So I think we might be a little bit understanding if they didn't have the skills to do that. The state was supposed to help with some of that skill building. Our, Our research center, we do a lot of financial training to help district leaders with this. And the messaging was confusing for many district leaders. Some of them heard that it was stimulus money. They should just spend it as fast as they could. Some of them thought, well, when the federal government's done with this chunk of money, the states will pick it up and then they'll fund for it. So I think there was just a lot of confusing messages in there. And that's why we're seeing some districts, you know, handle it pretty well and some really on shaky ground right now. The enrollment situation, it's been a big talking point in Seattle right now where the district is looking at closing a lot of elementary schools. Tukwila and Mercer Island school districts have seen double-digit decline in enrollment since the 2019-2020 school year. It's, It's an issue all over the place. But this has also happened before. Seattle closed elementary schools starting in 2007 because of low enrollment and then ended up reopening some of those because enrollment rebounded. That's something that parents are asking the district hard questions about, like, aren't you going to have that happen again where you close some schools and then have to backtrack? And isn't that more expensive in the long run? What would you say about the chances of 
rebounding enrollment and the cost of closure versus running schools at lower enrollment? First, I mean, it is true that districts have shrunk and then grown and shrunk and grown over the years. So that's nothing new. In fact, I think districts should get better at it, shrinking and growing. So if you don't have very many kids, maybe you do need to shrink some of your programs or your footprint, and then you grow again, you expand those again. But those tend to be like 10 or 20 year cycles. What is different this time is that the enrollment declines are because of widespread drops in birth rates. And that is especially true in urban areas. So if we can get out there and get young people to start having tons more kids, then maybe we could reverse this trend. But that trend does not look like it's subsiding. It's uh, more common in urban areas all across the country. It's not just a one city problem because an industry moved out or or things like that, but it, it is relatively widespread. And I do think across the country, this is going to be a theme for quite some time that we are we have too many schools in the US right now and we're going to have to probably close some over time and I think a lot of people are going to hate to see their school go and I'm sympathetic with that because you know that that's disruptive for families but the idea that in a year or two I'll we'll find a whole bunch more kids and they'll come back I think it doesn't really explain the situation we're in. Yeah. Marysville also had a couple levies fail in 2022. They say that knocked them back by about $25 million. Is that a cautionary tale for districts to rely on the idea that voters will raise their own taxes to fund schools there? I know in especially rural districts, it has become a tough road to hoe to get those levies passed. Yeah. So nationally, I think a lot of districts tried going to the voters as they especially as they lost their federal relief funds, seeing if the local voters will fill in that hole. And that's worked in some locations, but we're seeing wider spread levy failures now than in the past. And part of that is because overall of spending is up. In, and that's true in Washington state where over the last decade, um, the state has put a lot more money in, in education. And I think in some places, voters are you know, trying trying to find that balance into how much money they would support, whether it's through their state taxes or their local taxes. But what we suggest for districts is, you know, sure, absolutely go to the voters, try to get a levy passed and have a contingency plan. So that cannot be your only plan, right? You have to have almost two budgets, one where maybe the levy passes and another budget where it doesn't. And you can roll out those plans simultaneously because, they are failing at a higher rate than we've seen in the past. Mm. Any final thoughts here? I mean, the Washington Association of School Administrators talked to the Seattle Times about lobbying Olympia for more money next year to fully fund special education, transportation, other operating costs of school districts. You know, final question, do you see the state bailing these districts out? Marysville, as an example, is that a long-term solution? Does the state need to spend more? I imagine that the state will probably meet the districts on some demands. And I, I don't think it'll go around and start bailing out individual districts. And that creates big equity problems over time and in some way rewards fiscal mismanagement in the sense of that. But at the same time, I think for district leaders, there there has to be a plan to spend the money you do get, right? The plan can't only be get more money. So sure, the the associations should go to the legislature, do what it can to get more money. That'll ultimately depend on what the legislature thinks. Maybe the legislature voters are nervous about upping state spending or have other priorities that they're interested in, like higher ed is going to be competing for more money. Uh, Some of these other services are as well. And the climate priorities and things like that. So there will always be this push and pull. But either way, the job of the district is to thoughtfully spend the money it does get. So it'll you have to work both sides of that equation, right? You really do have to figure out what you can do with the money you have if those additional funds don't come in. Marguerite Rosa is the director of the Edunomics Lab and a research professor at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. Thank you so much, Marguerite. It is Wonderful to have your perspective and expertise to walk us through all of this. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You're listening to SoundSide. By the way, we'd love to hear from you on this. If you are a Marysville parent or a teacher watching this financial meltdown and considering how it will impact your family, 
what's on your mind? Our email is soundside at K-U-O-W dot O-R-G, or you can leave us a voicemail at 206 206- 2213213 that's 2062213213 thanks for listening to soundside this show is only possible because listeners support us if you're able to give right now please check out the show notes for a link to donate and don't forget you can listen live on KUOW 94.9 FM Seattle at noon and 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday or anytime online at kuow.org